Hello and welcome to the Armenian News Network Rung Week in Review. I'm Aspet Bedrosian and I'm here together with Hovik Manucharian. This show was recorded on October 23, 2022. Before we begin the show, we'd like to request that you subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us on Twitter, and subscribe and rate our podcasts, which you can listen to wherever you get your podcasts. Our Grung links are on our Linktree page, which is on our profile pages, so you can find us everywhere on social media platforms. So if you like our shows, please share them with your friends and follow us everywhere you get your Armenian news. Thanks, and on with the show. Here are the major topics we'll talk about today. Monitors in Armenia. Between the EU civilian monitoring mission, a possible OSCE mission, a possible CSTO mission, there seems to be a race to send monitors to Armenia. What's all that about? The Russia-West rivalry in the South Caucasus is heating up. Like it or not, the war in Ukraine is spilling over into the South Caucasus and Armenia looks to be the current political battleground. We'll talk about this. Iran has fully engaged in Armenia through diplomacy and even through military exercise displays along its northern border. It has also opened a consulate in Sunik and stated that Armenia's security is tied to its own security. Those are fighting words, but what do they mean? It looks like Lebanon and Israel have agreed to sign a long contentious maritime agreement. Is it a win-win deal? We'll talk about that. And the current president's term expires on Halloween night in Lebanon. Spooky! But who is the next president? And what are the stakes for the Lebanese-Armenian community? To talk about these issues, we have with us Dr. Arthur Hachigian, who is an international relations expert from Stanford University specializing in intervention. He currently teaches at the Russian-Armenian University in Yerevan. We also have with us Yeri Atashian, who is a regional analyst and researcher based in Beirut with expertise in China, Iran, and the Persian Gulf. Tashian is Associate Fellow at the Isam Faris Institute for Public Policy and International Affairs at the American University of Beirut and a part-time instructor in international affairs at the American University for Science and Technology. Welcome to the show, everyone. Hello, everyone. Hello. Pleasure to be here. Hello, Aspet. Hello, everyone. Hi, Arthur. Hi, Nieria. Let's begin with the major news in Armenia geopolitically this week was uh, the monitors, the issue of monitors. And a couple of weeks ago, we were talking with Benjamin Pogosan and in his scenarios for securing the safety of Armenia uh, with what we have, he recommended that Armenia needs to negotiate and for indefinite or at least prolonged mission monitoring missions, uh, CSTO troops or whoever is able basically to throw people in Armenia to cause the dampening of Azerbaijan's uh, attacks on our borders. And it seems that as our, Armenia is indeed negotiating for international monitors, we knew already about EU, but now OSCE, CSTO, any presence, even civilian missions at this stage of negotiations with Azerbaijan. And uh, Aliyev's deadline of December 2022 is uh, looming. Uh, that's when he basically uh, essentially threatened to sort of take additional steps to apply pressure for Armenia to sign uh, you know, the so-called peace uh, agreement. And we are explicitly avoiding calling this peace process with Azerbaijan because uh, there can be no peace signed with a gun pointed to your head, no matter what Pashinyan wants to call it. One of the things that I wanted to look into is we all know the checkered history of peacekeeping and monitoring missions under different auspices, whether it's UN, NATO, OSCE, or the EU. Yet some people in Armenia, especially you know, even in geopolitical circles, are really excited about a limited two-month monitoring mission from the EU comprised of several dozen civilian monitors. Arthur, let's begin with you. What is Armenia's goal with these EU monitors? And you know, also 40 monitors for the entire border of hundreds of kilometers, I believe 400 or 500 kilometers. What's the deal? I don't know exactly what the area of deployment would be for the monitors. I know they'd probably be deployed in uh, Sunik or Zangizur, where, uh, and probably in Tavush near Lake Sevan, probably near the areas of recent attacks. There are a couple of things that need to be said. Number one, all this excitement about bringing in international monitors is probably very misguided. The monitors could register uh, violations of the ceasefire. They could register and report about certain violations, but they have absolutely no physical or military ability to stop an offensive by Azerbaijan. 
they are not even peacekeeping forces and even peacekeeping forces couldn't do it. So these are just uh, basically observers who could signal to the EU that violations have taken place. The thing is, we already know this. We already have seen this and nothing was done about it. There was a delegation of European uh, dignitaries, whatever they were called, uh, that just came here, observers actually, and they just said a couple of days ago that these shots did not come from Mars, they came from Azerbaijan. So we know it. So what? What are the consequences? Nothing, absolutely nothing, because Ursula von der something went to Baku and said that Azerbaijan is a strategic partner to Europe. Obviously, they need oil and gas. And Armenians, of all people, know what happens when Western fathers of democracy, human rights, choose between oil, gas, money, uh, territory, and interest, and morals, the international law, prevention of genocide. Armenians know this very well. So again, we have this illusion of uh, Western presence and Western protection, which is going to be blown to, to pieces the moment Aliyev wants to cross the border again and start shelling Armenia. They have no ability to defend us. They can only report about these violations. Uh, and no European force, no American force, no Western force would ever be deployed here. Certainly not with Russians still here. Uh, bearing in mind the two parties are at war with each other. I mean, you just could not have done this better. You could not have done this better. It's a total mess, misguided mess, a result of our diplomacy that has fallen to pieces, our lack of strategy, lack of direction, lack of experience, people who don't know what they're doing. We have a Russian force in Gyumri, we have a Russian force in Yerevan and on the border with Iran. And now we're inviting Russia's enemies to be on another border. We're probably gonna go down as the only country in the world that ever did that. Invite observers and armies from two combatants to come to its territory to keep peace. Number one. Number two, what is very interesting is that all these visitors, uh, these observers and Ms. Pelosi, whom I respect very much, who came here and gave a lot of moral support, but nothing more tangible than that. Uh, Monsieur Macron, who made lots of statements from Paris, a lot of beautiful words, but didn't say anything. He did not say anything. Pelosi didn't say anything. No one from Europe or the United States says anything about the prospect of ethnic cleansing and genocide in Karabakh. No one says anything about it. In Kosovo and Bosnia, the West bombed life out of Serbia to stop genocide, and it was right to do so in that case, to stop the genocide of uh, Bosniaks and later on Kosovars. This is exactly the same situation. We don't have a million and a half Albanians, but we have 120,000 Armenians. They're not that different. Nothing has been said about the prospect of genocide or ethnic cleansing, the same double standards, the same hypocrisy that we've seen throughout history. And I think this is where the Armenian community could maybe try to make a difference by putting pressure on the lawmakers in Washington and in Paris or whatever uh, to, to at least acknowledge, as Liz Truss has acknowledged shortly before <laughs> leaving office, right. that we're looking at another genocide coming our way and the West mm. should do something about it. Those are the, the issues for me. Thank you. And Yeria, going to you, I wanted to also for you to weigh in on these 40 EU monitors. And also, if you're aware of previous uh, history of international communities, peacekeeping missions, uh, what lessons can uh, the international community and Armenia draw from past successes and failures in international monitoring missions? Yeah, thank you, Lovic, for the question. First of all, I totally agree with uh, what Arthur uh, said. I will not add so much, but I will give the example of the UNIFIL in Lebanon, the UN-led uh, forces. When Israel bombed and invaded Lebanon in 2006, the UN observers, I mean, there is a peacekeeping mission. They just were like monitoring and they were just observing uh, while the Israelis were bombing, not just the military targets, but also the civilian targets. There was not a single reaction from UNIFIL. So the issue is that when the observers, especially the EU, the OSCE or even the CSTO will send on observers. First, we have to know whether these are civilian or military observers and what are their duties and responsibilities. Are they able to react? Will they, uh, for example, be armed? Uh, do they have the green light, for example, to respond to the Azerbaijani provocations? Or as what Arthur said, they will come just in order to monitor and to write or register, for example, the violations. We know that violations are happening. We need action and not just, for example, writing on a sheet of paper about uh, what Azerbaijan is doing. Otherwise, this is just a waste of time. 
we just heard the news towards the end of the week that the OSC is now sending a needs assessment team. So that's interesting. But uh, as if the OSC and the EU are not enough, the CSTO says it will meet soon and uh, it will be considering sending monitors to Armenia as uh, one of the recommendations from its fact-finding team. In Astana, President Putin said uh, Armenia, holding the presidency of the CSTO in 2022, should convene a CSTO Security Council meeting and request the troops it needs on its borders. This hasn't happened for months. I know that at least Armenian officials said that, you know, there, there have been scheduling conflicts or Armenia is trying to work through scheduling conflicts. But what is the holdup? Did they have an offer? Like, what's interesting to me is, was this offer of sending at least a monitoring mission from the OSC, just like the EU did, was it available to Armenia for months and was it ignored? Or basically, are, is Russia trying to sort of stonewall or, or at least try to make it look like it's uh, Russia and other CSTO countries are also trying to help, basically in, in response to the EU monitoring mission. Are you aware of any more detail in these West versus Russia monitors and who was first to offer and what, why are there so, so, such delays in the CSTO monitors specifically if they have been offered or if they have been recommended to be deployed? Despite the fact that it is not secret that with the war uh, and the military operations going in Ukraine, Russia's political influence to some extent have been minimized in South Caucasus. So the Russians, let's not say they are making a comeback, but at least they want to preserve their, their status in the region. So from one hand, they want to also send their own monitor because the Russians also, they propose many times to send peacekeeping forces, not just, I mean, they already have the Russian border guards guarding between in Azerbaijan and Armenia in some areas, but at the same time, I think the problem is that there is also like uh, this unity within the CSTO. I'm not sure, for example, if Belarus and Kazakhstan and other the Turkic republics will uh, are ready to send observers because their position is clear. Uh, it is very biased towards Azerbaijan. Even even the president of Kazakhstan he just said that these are border clashes. Actually, they were not border clashes as we know. They were clear incursions in the Armenian territory. So the problem is that what kind of mandate the CSTO uh, will have, and also I think if I'm not sure. Uh, this was before the 2020 war, where Belarusia also they uh, drafted something in their parliament where it limited or it prevented actually the sending of Belarusian soldiers outside their territory, even though when the events in Kazakhstan happened, the Belarusians participated. Uh, so I'm not sure if the Turkic republics will send observers and uh, whether their reports will be biased and also how Belarusia will uh, react to the problem is that the CSTO is not a unified structure. That's also concerning, uh, at least for the Armenians. That's very interesting because, as we know, Armenia has appealed both to Russia and the CSTO after the September 13 attack by Azerbaijan, the act of aggression by Azerbaijan. Arthur, maybe you have additional information for us. I mean, why couldn't, for instance, Russia is respond, basically sending its monitors, and would, would those be... Uh, acceptable to Armenia, were those ever in the off, you know, on the offing, if that's a good <laughs> term to use, uh, you know, what, what are your thoughts on this uh, whole uh, situation? Well, there are a lot of valid points that DIA made and a lot of things that need to be said. Regarding Russia and CSTO, they have clearly been stalling and there has been an incredible uh, outburst of anti-Russian sentiment in Armenia right now. Uh, there's a lot of anti-Russian propaganda. A lot of people are very disappointed that Russia has been very passive and been stalling. It looks like they're just trying to use some bureaucratic procedures to justify the lack of action. But there's a very simple reason for it, because of our genius strategists in the West who dismantled the world security system in the 90s and had this maniacal persistence on NATO expansion. We have this little war now. Uh, the rest of the world pretty much versus Russia, NATO versus Russia in Ukraine that has brought a tragedy of unprecedented proportions to the, to the population of Ukraine and to Russia. And now is, uh, there are certain uh, hints at a nuclear escalation today. So this by, is by far more important to the world, to Russia, to CSTO, to Europe, than the conflict in Armenia. So... Therefore, because of this war, because of this confrontation, Russia has been trying to win Turkey over for many, many years. 
and uh, it has succeeded in doing so. So Russia has no interest in going to war with Turkey right now or with Azerbaijan right now over Armenia. It has. It is clear it cannot and it doesn't want to do it right now. It is in the middle of this uh, catastrophic war in Ukraine, NATO versus Russia. That's another gift that the West has given us. Uh, this is number one. And um, Armenia also has done everything possible in the last four years to completely destroy its diplomacy. It's in shambles. This has been a a diplomatic fiasco. We destroyed our relationship with Russia. Russia continues to see us as a pro-Western anti-Russian regime. Sometimes they use it as an excuse, but sometimes they really think so. Uh, we have destroyed our relationship with the United States, uh, with Europe, uh, with Central Asia. On each of those fronts, Aliyev is light years ahead of us. He has an amazing relationship with Putin. He's been defending him right lately against Macron, even though Europe calls him a strategic partner and tries to suck up to him to be blunt uh, to get gas and oil uh, and he has been a great diplomat in central asia he has central asia in his pocket uh, belarus is his friend uh, europe apparently is a strategic partner so on every level he has been light years ahead of us armenians on the other hand have done anything they could to destroy their diplomatic uh, standing with russia with csto and apparently even with the west so that's that's what we have right now I think the only viable option would be to have some forces here from a country that could back it up with action. If there is an attack, if there is a war, uh, these uh, observers or peacekeepers, whatever you call them, they need to represent a country that is actually willing to fight, willing to stop a war, invasion. Aliyev is not kidding. These are not going to be just some skirmishes. It's going to be another offensive. So a country with real interests here is the only country that could protect us against against that. And right now, it's very difficult to see who that might be. Russia is very busy. Iran is making some encouraging statements, but the West would not tolerate any kind of Iranian force in Armenia. And the West is giving us beautiful words and phrases about human rights and freedoms, uh, etc., ignoring the fact that we're about to have 120,000 Armenians deported or massacred. So it's a, it, it just could not get worse. It's a very, very pessimistic situation here and it's hard to see where where our relief would come from yeah we will talk about iran actually separately um uh, so speaking of the war in ukraine and the russia versus the rest of the world or the rest of the west western world uh you could hear it in macron's statements uh, saying that basically russia conspired with turkey against armenia you could hear it in uh u.s official statements including state department briefings where vedant patel said that the entire region should be concerned about uh, Russia-Iran cooperation. Uh, or when Palon, uh, whom I uh, a few shows ago called a friend of the Armenians, said essentially that Russia has no future in the Caucasus and that Armenia has to accept an autonomous status for Artsakh that was existent in Soviet times uh, in an interview on Armenian public TV. Experts have warned that the lack of cooperation, or in this case, outright rivalry between the West and Russia, in our region is against Armenia's interests, yet at first glance, it seems that's where we're headed. The animosity between West and Russia and Iran is coming off loud and clear. And in terms of the Artsakh conflict, it seems that the West uh, has collectively recognized, uh, at least, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems that the West has collectively recognized the sovereignty of Azerbaijan over Artsakh, even with Macron uh, wavering on the status of Artsakh. And the Russian proposal uh, for uh, so-called peace is uh, only a tad bit less discouraging. The Russians offer a very similar plan, uh, which in reality is a capitulation again, but with the status of Artsakh to be decided at a future date without any clear prescription of when and how and what happens in the meantime. Will Armenia be forced to choose sides or can it afford to play the complementarism card? Arthur. Okay, so a lot has been said, a lot of important points. As for the U.S., it should come as no surprise that the U.S. wants Russia to leave the Caucasus and certainly is concerned about any cooperation with Russia and Iran. The U.S. is not concerned with the prospect of genocide in Karabakh, apparently, because that's not Kosovo. And the U.S. is not concerned with the prospect of Azeri advances in Armenian territory. 
I haven't heard of any real practical steps that the US is willing to take, just apparently a couple of phone calls, which is great. It's good to start, but nothing else happened after that. As for Macron, I read his statement very, very carefully. So again, number one, he recognizes that Karabakh is part of Azerbaijan. He doesn't say a word about the population, uh, 120,000 people who are about to be massacred. He says nothing about it. He says nothing about what Europe might do to prevent another genocide. He doesn't say that. Burrell doesn't say that. Ursula von der whatever doesn't say that. No one says that. There are 120,000 people who are waiting to be either deported or massacred. If Russia withdraws from there, that's exactly what's going to happen to them. And no one seems to be concerned about it. As for Russia, at least Russia is still protecting a part of this region and the part of its population. And you've heard some appeals. Uh, three days ago, the leader of Karabakh said, Russia is our only hope. And a few days before that, the regional council, I believe, whatever that body is called, appealed to Russia to recognize Karabakh. So they clearly count on Russia to save them. And Russia is the only country that has troops in there. So I don't know what standing Macron has to speak about Russian conspiracy with Turkey and Azerbaijan when his country has done nothing to stop the war two years ago when the issue of Karabakh was resolved by force despite all the promises made by the European uh, mediators that will never be sold by force, it was. It's now an accomplished fact. And France, France says nothing about it. Nothing was done during the war to help us. Nothing was done during the war by the West, France, America, or the other countries to help Armenia militarily or send us money or to condemn Turkey or impose sanctions on Turkey. Nothing. When Turkey invaded Syria, at least Canada and some Western countries imposed uh, an arms embargo. Nothing like that was done for Armenians. So I'm not sure that Macron is in a position to accuse Russia of conspiring with Turkey when Russia at least, at least tried to stop the war three times and stopped it the third time. And that's actually the fault of the Armenian so-called government because they refused to stop the war twice. And at least Russia is still protecting part of Karabakh, although it was very passive, responding to recent attacks, admittedly, and understandably, because the West and Russia are now at this combat of cosmic proportions. This is, a, this is a huge deal. This is the first time we have a European war since 1945. And it's an industrial war. It's a war of satellites, drones, missile systems, air defense systems. And again, today, there is news of Ukraine developing a dirty bomb, radiological right. weapon, which will prompt a Russian uh, preemptive strike. There's no doubt about it. This is what right. probably, I assume this is what the Russian defense minister was talking about. So what the West should do is point its finger at itself for 20 years of disaster and catastrophe that its obsession with NATO expansion has brought us. And I'm, I'm, I'm one of many, many, many American scholars who think exactly the same way. There were some politicians in the Clinton administration and later on obsessed with their own egos and their narcissism and their Russophobia and their irredentism and desire to take revenge. Okay. And they did not have the wisdom of preserving the international system the way it was the post-Cold War in the 90s. What we see right. now is the direct result of that, direct result. Ukraine, okay. Georgia, Armenia. Uh, Yeria, I wanted to ask the same question to you, but sort of basically more focused. Uh, will Armenia be forced to choose sides? And which way do you think the Pashinyan government is leaning? And your analysis of, uh, you know, whether that's a good or bad idea. As you know, I have a lot of reservations on Pashinyan's government, especially when it comes to foreign policy making. Uh, one of the things that was good during Serge Sarkisian period, despite the fact that I have also a lot of reservations on Sarkisian, but at least he had a balanced foreign policy. He was engaging with China. I haven't seen anything, for example, in the last three years, any engagement with the Chinese. And after the 2020 war, the Chinese took, let's say, a pro azerbaijani if not a pro azerbaijani but to some extent, it, the Chinese were supporting the territorial integrity of Azerbaijan. And there was no official or high, high official meeting between China and um, Armenia, which was, the, I mean, which wasn't the case with during the Sarkisian period. We had also military agreements between, uh, we purchased a lot of weapons from uh, China. The same, I mean, with also with Russia, we haven't seen any uh, progress in the Armenian-Russian relations. There are just talks, for example, I remember when 
I forgot the name of the former uh, defense minister who resigned when he visited uh, Artsakh. Varashak ba- Arutunyan. Varashak, yeah, if I'm not mistaken. So when he traveled to Russia, he engaged in many military deals with the Russians. And if we remember, the Russians were also promising to reform the army and, uh, army and upgrade it. And uh, Aliyev was also warning and he expressed his concern that why the Russians after the war are supporting the army and army and ref- trying to reform the army. And then after his resignation we haven't heard anything when it comes to the armenian uh, russian military uh, relations yes i know that the russians are stuck in the ukrainian mud uh, maybe that is why they are not able to sell us heavy weapons but what about before 2021 i mean uh, or 2022 before february uh, for two years we haven't done anything we haven't bought any weapon against the drone system uh, is or uh, can armenia not uh, afford to not choose sides and play its complementarism card like ser sarkisian did and also which way is the armenian government leaning today it seems we are heading towards the west and as Erto said we are swallowing the promises the empty promises made by the western uh, leaders unless if they provide us uh, heavy weapons but the problem is that there is also from armenia i am hearing from many uh, specialists that arguing that the west is not uh, helping us unless we leave the CSTO. this is not a nonsense because actually we purchase a lot of weapons even from western countries while we are uh, CSTO members so there is this risk actually that some armenians are leaning to leave or pushing for a leaving from the CSTO because there may be there are some promises by the americans or the by western leaders that they are ready to sell weapons to Armenia, but I'm not sure about it. I just want to say I totally agree with what the guy is saying. I totally agree. And I said many of the same things earlier. The last two years, nothing was done to strengthen our army. Those 300 guys who died in September didn't have to die. We did nothing. We didn't get any weapons. We continued to ruin our diplomacy. As far, and, and I, I think you understand how I feel about this group. I don't even call them a government. As far as the choices... Well, these people, this group is leaning towards the West, but the West offers us nothing but surrender. We have to surrender the population of Karabakh to ethnic cleansing, and they say nothing about it with all their commitment to human rights and all that empty rhetoric that they usually pull on us. And there will be no one to protect Armenia. And we're now surrounded from from three sides by Turkey and Azerbaijan, who have a 40 to 1 advantage militarily in terms of the military budget and the size of the military, etc. They probably Promise has nothing. And this argument, the Agia is right. This is another uh, silly argument that's being discussed in Armenia that once we leave uh, the CSTO, then the West will help. No one has said that. No one has promised that. We don't have it in writing. We don't have, we don't have any verbal assurances. People just make it up. And he's right that some people just might be silly enough to do it. And this government is leaning towards the West. And this is why we have destroyed our relationship with, with Russia and only now trying to build something with Iran. I don't think this is, this is a choice. What we have to do is very clear, but we have an incompetent or there's another word for it, a group that works for another government planted here just to, to bring its country, this country to its knees, which it has succeeded to do in the last four years. Arthur and Yeria, uh, if you have uh, quickly, um, uh, we know uh, the stance of the West on uh, the status of Artsakh and so forth. We talked about this uh, sort of so-called peace agreement, capitulation agreement. Just very, you know, in a few sentences, what the, does the... Uh, does the position of the West or Russia differ significantly when it comes to the status of the so-called the Zangezur cor- corridor and whether it should be extraterritorial or somehow a reciprocal with the Lachin corridor? Are you aware whether the opinions of the West and Russia differ significantly on this? Yeah, just also to make a small comment, because even though when I'm participating in international conferences, I'm realizing that the West is offering something about Artsakh, which is out of imagination, which is a cultural autonomy. And my argument is that this is slow that, while the fra- from the Russian perspective, they are just offering the freezing of the conflict. Uh, this is regarding nagorno karabakh regarding uh, the issue of the Zanke. So, so there are different signals coming from the West, from First, the first uh, official signal is that the West is against because they are thinking that the Russians and the Turks are engaging and this will also bypass the American sanctions and the Russians will be able to send their military cargoes and uh, they will use as a military transit. This is also nonsense because the, uh, the Russians, they haven't said anything about it. And at the same time, in the trilateral statement, the problem is that even though it is not mentioned the word corridor, but it's saying that 
unobstructed uh, transit or something like it. And this word is being interpreted by the Azerbaijanis as a uh, corridor where they will not pay any cost for the Armenians. From the other side, also, we are uh, reading some in the Western media that uh, this is good because uh, from the Turkish and the NATO perspective, this will bypass Russia, this corridor, and this will threaten Turkey and it will minimize the Russian presence in South Caucasus because also it will try to isolate Iran. So there are two perspectives from the West. From the Russian perspective, I think, yes, the Russians are against giving any corridor that is violating the sovereignty of Armenia, but at the same time, they want to control this trade route in order to also exercise the pressure in the future on the uh, Turks and the Azerbaijanis so that the Turks or the, uh, or the Azerbaijanis in the future, they don't use this so-called corridor or let's say trade route as a pretext to invade Armenia. Because my concern is that the first step, if Azerbaijan takes a corridor, the first step will be taking the corridor. The second, they will also use a pretext and say that they will try to populate the corridor with some Azerbaijanis and they will maybe open markets and hotels and everything. And then eventually the later step will be just to occupying and cutting Southern Armenia. That is why the Iranians, I mean, we'll talk later about the Iranian perspective. That is why the Iranians are alarmed because they already know very well what will come after the first step. An interesting article about this was printed uh, in the end of September in I believe Foreign Policy magazine. Yes, yes, least, yes. Uh, Stephen Blank. That, yeah. Uh, yeah, Stephen Blank, uh, who is a senior res- research uh, fellow at the Foreign Policy Research Institute, wrote I an think article. The title of it was, uh, the foreign policy. Yeah, Even- uh, and the title for those who just want to search for it is Armenia must build the Zangiz corridor. So, Arthur, any thoughts you have on this issue? Oh yeah, guys, hundred percent on. He's hundred percent accurate. The West uh, just, you know, has this formula. I mean, he knows this better than I do. There was a formula of uh, uh, unobstructed access or whatever. It's interesting that no one wants to finally say it. Is it going to be ex-territorial or not? Is it going to be part of Armenia or is it going to be part of another country's territory going through Armenia? Which means that we will gradually lose that well, not gradually, we'll lose that immediately and then we'll lose the rest of Sunni. So we'll, we're going to lose our southern province that connects us to Iran very quickly if Turkey imposes its control on it. So there is no clear definition from the West. With all these accusations of Russia, the West says nothing whether or not this will be an ter- extraterritorial, uh, extraterritorial corridor. As for Russia, I've heard it twice from two different Russian officials that this will not be an extraterritorial corridor. Yeah, yeah, he's right. This will be a part of Armenian uh, territory under Armenian sovereignty. But yes, Russia wants to have some control of it. And given the options, I'm, I'm not convinced that it's such a bad idea. Then how do, how do we interpret the statement by uh, Arad Mirzoyan last week, where he said basically that some unexpected third countries are taking the Azerbaijani interpretation of uh, the word, you know, the, the concept of corridor. I mean, everyone took that as a direct accusation at Russia, even though the word Russia was not mentioned in that statement. Why is this team and this government accusing Russia? I used to say that they are incompetent, and they are incompetent. They have no experience, no education. They came literally from the street. But I don't think it's just incompetence. I think there was a mission, and they had a mission, probably from the start, from all those organizations that sponsor anti-Russian sentiment in Armenia and the desire to tear us away from Russia and then throw it in Turkey's mouth. So I think that's it's part of their policy from day one. Arat Mirzoyan was the one burning the Russian flag in front of the Russian embassy. They were calling the Russian ambassador in Yerevan. Pashinyan was personally doing that and mocking him. They were throwing boots with blood on them at the Russian embassy. These people were doing it. And we're surprised that Russia understands that these are an anti-Russian regime. Of course they do. They know what they have done. So this is their mission. Uh, I, I don't think it's just incompetence. I used to say that. I think it's more than that. It's more than that. It's their mission, and they're going to do it if, unless somebody stops them. And I agree with the idea. Once this corridor is declared ex-territorial, then it will be declared vital zone of interest for the Turkic world, which means the Turkish troops might come very quickly. The Turkish population might come quickly. And then goodbye, Sunni. Goodbye, Goris, Kapa, Meri. We can kiss that goodbye forever. We've seen that We've seen that scenario uh, pan out in Syria and Iraq, I guess. Uh, so Exactly, from, uh, exactly. And my favorite part of what happened in Syria was how Donald Trump called Erdogan, the Turkish army, uh, the army, the American army retreat and the Kurds were surrendered to the Turks on a silver platter and they destroyed them. And they're still there. 
And not a single European government or American government condemns the fact that Turkey is occupying uh, north, uh, the nor northern regions in Syria, the 30 kilometer buffer zone. They're still occupying them. And, and the Kurds were driven out of there. Another ethnic cleansing. And again, it went without any consequence for Turkey. Only some countries, Canada and some European countries, imposed an arms embargo. But the way the U.S. Army was ordered to retreat and surrender its staunchest allies betray yeah. its allies and surrender them to Erdogan. That was distasteful. That was just very, very distasteful. And a lot of American generals and officers had the dignity to speak up against it. In the trilateral statement, I think there's a word that it is very tricky. And I, I don't still get it that how the Armenian side signed this paper while it's saying that uh, the Republic of Armenia shall guarantee the security transport connection and so on, uh, arrange an unobstructed movement of persons, vehicle, and cargo in both directions. The problem is that what was Pashinyan thinking when he literally saw this word? And from the Azerbaijani perspective, the interpretation is that so it should be an unobstructed movement of everything. So it's a corridor. So that was a huge mistake the Armenian side actually did. And I'm not sure what the Russians were thinking by that word. Maybe they had another interpretation. But from the Armenian side, it was a huge diplomatic mistake when they signed this uh, statement uh, reading this word. I think unobstructed means no customs. So if there are no customs, then it's not your territory, unless it's considered some kind of a free trade zone. Uh, I'm not sure about the diplomatic details of what was discussed, but unobstructed will probably be interpreted by Turkey and Azerbaijan as there is no Armenian customs. There are no Armenian customs. So that puts us almost on the verge of declaring this an exterritorial corridor. Okay, let's talk a little bit about Iran-Armenia relations. In the past month, Iran has fully activated its diplomacy as well as its military in the northern direction. It appears that the aftershock of Armenia's losses in the 44-day war have awakened Iran to its own present disadvantageous positions vis-à-vis -vis its traditional competitors as well as enemies, and that includes Turkey, Azerbaijan, Russia, as well as the West, the U.S., and the EU. We can even include Israel in this list due to the worrisome defense cooperation between Israel and Azerbaijan. At every summit recently, or conference, Iran has reiterated its red line about keeping the Iran-Armenia border intact through all the geopolitical changes. And most recently, the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps, the IRGC, has begun conducting massive military exercises in the northern direction. Reportedly, the exercises point at readiness to invade Azerbaijan, Nakhichevan, and defend Armenian borders deep into its territory. Yeria, can you help explain the stakes for Iran in the South Caucasus, specifically through Armenia? Uh, yes. Uh, in February, I was in Yerevan, and there was a conference organized by the Oriental Studies Institute and the Iranian uh, embassy there. So basically, we talked and discussed the red lines from the ir Iranian perspective, and we directly talked with the ambassador there. So there are many red lines. The first red line is the Israeli uh, presence in the region. And this is important to note that Azerbaijan is building mega infrastructures and airports in the occupied territories of Artsakh, not for infrastructure, not for the Azerbaijanis, because actually the distance between each airport is almost like one hour or one and a half hour. So you, with, uh, with just a car, you can drive. Uh, but it seems that the main idea of building these airports is to use for military uh, purpose by the Israelis so that in the future maybe they will use in order to gather intelligence reports from Iran and also maybe to bomb Iran uh, if a war will happen between Israel and uh, Iran. And the second uh, red line is also the Turkish uh, presence because as we remember then when the war started in 2020 there were also protests by the Iranian Azeris uh, in the Iranian side of the border uh, and they showed solidarity with their ethnic kings uh, during the Armenian Azerbaijani war even with the recent protests we also saw the Azerbaijanis burning the Iranian flags burning Khamis pictures uh, so this it seems increase of pan turkism and pan azerbaijanism in iran and this is also concern that the iranians they don't want to see another war in the region because they know that this war also will uh, spread in iran the third threat for the iranians or the red lines is the change of balance of power in the region also in change of territories in the region because as I said, uh, there is also a geoeconomic interest. Maybe we'll talk later from the Iranian perspective. Yes, Iran has 
uh, a transit to Russia through Turkey, through uh, Azerbaijan, but also the Iranians are very concerned that if they lose their transit uh, with Russia through Armenia, then their uh, geoeconomic interest actually will be at the mercy of the Azerbaijanis and the Turks, and they don't want them. They always want to have many options in order to use as a card in the future to pressure over Azerbaijan or Turkey. And when they lose this transit with Armenia, then they will have not a single pressure card to use against Azerbaijan or Turkey. That makes a lot of sense and it's accurate. I would just like to add, as you know, there was a consulate that opened recently in Kaban and the newly appointed Iranian counselor made a few, council made a few uh, rather strong statements. He said that Armenians have nothing to fear, that we take, we will take care of their security like we take care of our own security. So there are some pretty strong statements made. And uh, I mean, to an extent, yes, it does help deter an Azerian Turkish attack, but whether or not Iran is actually going to back it up with military force is an open question. Arthur, are Western observers on Armenia's eastern borders, whether they are the EU civilian monitoring group or some OSCE mission or even CSTO, a threat to Iran's security interests? Well, it's an irritant. Uh, It's certainly a sign of things to come, because if there is a European force uh, deployed here, even if it's a symbolic force, of course, it will be an irritant to Iran. Iran is not going to like that because that's Western presence. Uh, I mean, I have just I haven't been really following these observers, just kind Mm -hmm. of reading their statements, because for me, they're absolutely irrelevant. Uh, Unless Europe or the West is willing to back it up with some real military presence here, they're of no value to us. But yes, yeah, certainly Iran is not going to like that. Obviously not. Yeah, as you mentioned, this past week Iran opened its consulate in Gapan. The foreign ministers of both countries were present and emphasized the close relations between the two countries. And Iran's foreign minister, Abdullahian, said that Armenia's security was Iran's own security. Iran has also announced a number of economic investments in Armenia, including a manufacturing line for auto exports for the Eurasian Economic Union. I want to quickly ask Yeria, are Iran's interests primarily driven by geopolitics or economic interests? Is Iran protecting its north-south economic corridor or Armenia? Thank you, Asper, for this question. Actually, I can say both geoeconomics and geopolitics. When it comes to geoeconomics, the Iranians and also the Indians, they have two uh, visions. First is the north-south corridor, which actually passes uh, from uh, also from Azerbaijan, because Azerbaijan, compared to Armenia, its, its infrastructure is much more modern and much more attractive. Uh, and also they have a railway, unlike Armenia, because we don't have a railway with Iran. But also Armenia plays an important role when it comes to uh, the Black Sea and the Persian Gulf corridor, and that is why the Armenians now are doing their best in order to invest in the North-South highway. But the problem is that this corridor also bypasses Russia. So basically it goes from India to uh, Iran, Armenia, Georgia, and to the Black Sea. And this is also a concern for, for the Russians. So how Armenia will balance between between the Russian interest, the Iranian and the Indian, and the European interest, because this project is also supported by the Europeans, it will be very tricky. I think the Armenians can, if they can engage in a, a bit clever diplomacy, uh, because for Armenia, this is very essential, uh, because when you increase your geoeconomic role, you also increase your geopolitical role. Mm-hmm. Uh, for, also, uh, Iran has geopolitical interests that, I, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the Iranians will do their best to contain the Turkish interest. But the problem is that unlike in the Middle East, the Iranians, they do not have allies or the proxies on the ground. For example, in the Middle East, the Iranians, they have Hezbollah, the Syrian uh, state, the Iraqi militias, the Houthis in Yemen. In South Caucasus, the Iranians do not have. The Iranians more engage in soft power. That is why they try to engage with the Azerbaijanis, also with the Armenians, and they can do military exercises. The problem is that I think the Iranians also have limitations. I'm not sure that the Iranians are not ready to go to war. Maybe the West is pushing for a war between Turkey and Iran, and this will be also fit will be disastrous for the Iranians. I'm not saying that the Iranians will be defeated, but also will be disastrous for the Iranians because my concern is that the West and the Turks maybe will try to explode Iran from within by spreading or propagating the pan azerbaijan It can be pan- even worse for Armenia. Yes, of course, because the war will happen in the Armenian territories. It will happen in Sunik, and Sunik will become a proxy of multiple warring sides. And this is uh, disastrous for Armenia. Arthur, what is the likelihood of Iran going to war for Armenia's territorial integrity? It's a hypothetical question. I think yeah. I think supporting Armenians diplomatically, politically, arming them, giving them advisors, kind of doing what the West is doing in Ukraine, is much, much more likely. 
than a direct involvement. And of course, as you said, there is a chance that the West will use this to gradually engage Iran and try to destroy it, uh, which is their dream, of course. So I think I think they're more likely to help with advisors and weapons, just like they're doing doing it for Russia now with their mm -hmm. drones and instructors in Crimea and now even tactical missiles. So, I mean, that could really help, uh, especially combined with, with Russian aid. So, I mean, when you're talking about the choices between the East and the West, it's, it's very clear the only chance we have strategically, militarily, is to be with the East, which is Iran, Russia, possibly India. This is where real politik drives us. Uh, Armenians always had a pr problem reconciling their aesthetic tastes with their geography. Our geography is here, and our aesthetic taste is in Europe, listening to Charles Navour or in America, listening to, I don't know, Kim Kardashian, whatever. We just cannot put the two together. This is the problem. And we're also very naive and not very savvy in realpolitik. This is where our problems come from. So in terms of choosing, yes, you can have economic relations with many different countries, but in terms of the military strategic alliances, you cannot be part of the triple entente and triple alliance at the same time. This doesn't work. Militarily, you have to pick your side. And that's been yeah. our problem, especially during the last disastrous four years. So that's what I think. They will help, probably give weapons, give instructors, whether or not they will actually send their troops. That's less likely. Maybe this will happen, but I, I, can't, I don't want to be a fortune teller. It's interesting that you mentioned about uh, rearming the armed forces and everything. In the past week, Defense Minister Suren Babigyan paid a long visit to India after Armenia's nearly one quarter billion dollar purchase of Indian weaponry, and that included MLRS systems, surface to air missiles, other weaponry. Armenia is said to be considering right now further purchases. Babigyan also attended a defense expo in New Delhi with high level uh, officials from their defense uh, department. While Babigyan was in India this week, reports also came out that Armenia is considering buying Iranian drones, which are proving their value in the battle for Russia in Ukraine. But, but let me just quickly jump in. Regarding the drones, the one thing I want to point out, Europe is already imposing sanctions uh, on those countries that are trying to yes, buy indeed. Iranian drones. So we're going to come up, we're going to be next. The, the hypocrisy of this thing, the double standard is just staggering. So buying drones from Iran. Yeah, so do talk about that. After decades of the Armenian military being armed by Russia, why would you say Armenia is shopping in India and Iran right now? Why are they doing that? It's not clear why we can't get weapons from Russia. I don't think Russia is running out of them, although it certainly needs them in Ukraine right now. Uh, these people, this so-called government, they're saying we paid for the weapons, but Russia never gave it to us. And then the next day they said, not, they said, oh, we never said, any, said anything of the sort. That's right. These are swindlers. These people are swindlers. It's impossible to know what is really happening. What are they deciding? What are they trying to do? We don't know if Russia actually sold us weapons. We never got them or they refused to sell us weapons. We, we, we don't understand that. We could certainly get it from Russia. Iran obviously is a very uh, desirable partner, especially now that Russia is buying weapons from Iran. It certainly will have no objection to us buying weapons from Iran. As for India, I mean, of course, in any conflict, when Pakistan is backing Azerbaijan and not even recognizing Armenia, of course, you're going to go to uh, Pakistan's arch enemy, India, for support. So that can help. But as Yerya said very intelligently, what we needed to do was to get some weapon systems to defend ourselves against the drones. And we needed to do that two years ago, four years ago, 10 years ago, not now. We didn't have to lose 300 young men, some of whom are still lying in those canyons. You know, they, they can't, they still can't bring them back to their mothers and fathers. Their, their bodies are still lying there. You know that. So this should have been done earlier, but it's certainly a step in the right direction. Okay. Yeah, yeah. The same question to you. Why is Armenia shopping with India and Iran right now? Uh, I guess I totally agree. I mean, the problem is that we are not sure if the Russians are really out of the stock or not. Or at the same time, I remember very well when Pashinyan said that the Russian weapons held the scandal, it was functional, only 10% was functional. And this was very provocation for the Russian and also for the Russian market when it comes to the arms market. We know that how scandal is very effective. Maybe the Russians are concerned that if they sell heavy weapons to Armenia, again, Pashinyan will do such uh, irresponsible comments and also uh, harm the prestige of the Russian weapon in the international arms uh, market. I'm not sure. Uh, That's a good point, a, actually. Course, good point. Uh, yeah, this is just an assumption. I'm not sure. But also, let's not forget um, that the Iranian consular in Kapan, he said that Armenia doesn't need 
aggressive or something like this weapon. So I'm mm. not sure what was the hint behind this sentence. So maybe trying see, to I mean, placate yeah. Azerbaijan. Maybe he was trying to yeah. calm down Azerbaijan. Yeah, that was a very odd statement, uh, and I was going to ask you about that. But maybe the Iranians also they want to keep a low profile because even they are the officials they are denying that they are selling uh, drones to the Russians, but eventually they are selling. So we'll see. I mean, what will happen in the couple of weeks? Yeah. maybe. Arthur just mentioned that uh, Western countries are putting sanctions against the Iranian drone manufacturers. So at, at, given that, uh, can Armenia afford to anger the West by buying Iranian drones? Is the current government capable of taking a risk like that? It'll be very hard. Maybe since our government has a good relations with the West, maybe they can, I don't know, convince the West uh, that we have to engage with the Iranians, but I'm not sure because even when the consulate was open, I didn't see a lot of officials from the Arvinga, only the, the foreign minister was there, but I didn't see a lot of officials from the civic contract party, for example. This should be like high officials, high level officials should be there because this was very important for the Armenians, the opening of consulate in uh, Kapan. Uh, it seems, I don't know, this was a push or this was an act taken by the Iranians and not from the Armenian side. So given what we have talked about so far, can you tell me what Armenia's vision for and self-perceived role in the region is? Armenia wants to be anywhere where it can survive right now. The, the mood in the country is very defeatist, There's widespread uh, despair, apathy. People don't know what will happen tomorrow. People don't know if Armenia will be there in three months from now, when the Azeris are going to attack. People were hoping that the West would protect them, naively, of course. And there was this outpouring of uh, pro-Western sentiment when Pelosi was here and nothing specific happened. It's just like the 1920s or 1915 again. The same hopes were dashed. Uh, people don't know where to turn to. There's this, as I told you, there's a huge surge in an anti-Russian sentiment because Russia was slow to respond and CSTO was slow to respond. So we're between a rock and a hard place. I think that's a good, that's a good way to describe it, between the rock and a hard place. I think uh, like if we, if we pick the least of evils, that would certainly be the Russian plan, which will allow us to keep a part of uh, Karabakh and freeze the, uh, the, uh, the conflict for the moment, as Yegya correctly said, rather than surrender it right away and also not give an ex-territorial corridor and have some kind of Russian-Iranian backing for Armenian security. I think that's clearly the only option that would uh, you know, satisfy our security needs. Other than that, of course, we could surrender Artsakh and give up the corridor and then have Western observers here and hope that uh, the West will protect us like it did in 1920 or 1915 or in 1878 or all those dates where we counted on them and we failed miserably. But if we want to do this again, sure, we can go ahead and do it. To me, there are eerie parallels with 100 years ago all the way to the occurrence of the pandemic, 100 years ago and then two years ago. Uh, Yeria, what are your thoughts? I totally agree with Arthur that the problem is that we as Armenians will never take lessons from history. The importance of Sunik for Turkey and the Kemalis and the Ottomans was the same. They wanted a corridor or a passage. Even if we, we read uh, the Kemalis invasion on the Republic of Armenia after 1919, we see that how the Turks were eager to cut Armenia from the south and unify the Turkic world. Um, but from the Armenian perspective, I mean, what we should do, uh, um, the first thing is that there, there is no relation between the state and the diaspora, or at least institutions in the diaspora. There should be a dialogue mm -hmm. uh, when it comes. I'm not sure that the current government is ready uh, to make some ideological compromises but at least there should be a common understanding. The same goes when it comes to domestic politics in Armenia. I'm not expecting that there should be a clear dialogue. It seems that also the dialogue or whatever happened between the former three presidents, it seems it failed, unfortunately. But at least, for example, uh, there should be a dialogue between the opposition and the government. The problem is that at least to agree on the red lines, what is our national uh, security? And I'm convinced that at the same time that the current opposition will not able to topple or the, or the current government. I'm convinced that because of the geopolitical situation, but also domestically, because it seems that the opposition is fragmented. And this is an unfortunate. Uh, but at least when it comes to national security, I mean, if Pashinyan had really he was a patriot, at least he used to, for example, shuffle the government or at least bring ministers 
bureaucratic ministers, when it comes to the defense ministry, when it comes to the foreign ministry, that are to some extent closed also to the public and to the opposition, at least that the opposition also to engage with the Russians, because it's not a secret that the opposition has also good relations with the Russians and the Iranians through the diaspora, but also uh, former ties, like former uh, President Sarkisyan and Kocharyan. So maybe they can use, uh, it will be like a division of work, the current uh, government will engage with the Western partners, but at the same time, the former, let's say, elites will also uh, use their back channels and engage with the Russians and Iranians. Because we need a division of work, we, this is typical division of labor, and in order to have a m diversity in our foreign policy. But it seems this is not working, and the current government, they don't want to engage in dialogue, and the same with the opposition, that they want to engage in dialogue with the government, and this is why Armenia is doomed. Okay, Yeria, since we have you on our show, I want to talk about a couple of Lebanon topics, a couple of questions for you. After years of stop and start negotiations, Lebanon and Israel have announced that a maritime agreement brokered by the U.S. is essentially agreed upon at this point. We're including a couple of links in our show notes, so go take a look at those to read about the details of the agreement itself. So, Yeria, can you give us the 10,000-foot view of this agreement? Is this a win-win for both countries and the outlook for economic benefits for Lebanon? It is also to, uh, important to connect the developments in uh, Middle East to South, because especially when it comes to energy security, because the West is eager to diversify its energy supply resources, but at the same time, it's important to note that the gas exports from the East Mediterranean will never try to close or fill the gap of the Russian supply to uh, Europe. I mean, Israel and uh, Egypt, they can maybe cover only 1% of the Russian supply to Europe. This is also, we should make sure. But at the same time, I mean, yes, to some extent, it was a win-win solution because the Lebanese were eager to find the solution. But from Israel, it's also more it's beneficial to Israel because Israel can exploit the gas exploration and the gas production very quickly because they have the infrastructure, they can attract investments easily from China and from the West. But Lebanon, because Lebanon, is, I mean, Lebanon has a very poor infrastructure, so the gas exploration in Lebanon will take a lot of time, maybe I assume something between three and five years. So and from the Israeli perspective, also it's good because it also tried to postpone or at least prevent a major war between Hezbollah and Israel because a war uh, between both sides, it's not beneficial for the Israelis because Hezbollah can easily destroy the whole infrastructure in Israel. But the Israelis, I mean, in Lebanon, we don't have an infrastructure to be destroyed. For it. Already mm -hmm. it is destroyed. So it's nothing for the Lebanese if war will happen, but it will hurt the Israeli economy. So I think also it's important domestically because uh, it is beneficial for the current government in Israel to use this as a card uh, pressure against Netanyahu. One final question. On Thursday this week, the Lebanese parliament again failed to elect a new president, and the current president, Michel Aoun's term ends on Halloween, a week from now, October 31st. Can you give us a high-level overview of what the state of affairs of the presidential politics are? And also, of course, we're very interested in what the stakes are in this for the Lebanese-Armenian community. Uh, yes, definitely. I mean, on the short run, I don't see any new president coming in Lebanon. It seems that there will be a package deal that the new president will come with a reformed uh, constitution or something like this in uh, Lebanon because, the, I mean, the, the state has failed. Everything is failing. The institutions are failing. The banking system has failed. We are becoming typical like Somalia. Um, so I don't see a president unless a deal is agreed maybe between the Iranians and the Americans and the other regional partners, maybe the mm -hmm. Russians and the Saudis, because actually the Russians and the Saudis, they have very good relations. Uh, so and I'm sure this will have an impact also reflect on uh, Lebanon. We should not also ignore the Turkish factor here in Lebanon. So it's a very long uh, path. Of course, this will also reflect on the Armenian committee. The number is shrinking already. I don't see a middle class in the army and the middle class already evaporated. The good thing is that many are repatriating to Armenia. This is uh, positive, but on also uh, a lot of families are uh, migrating to Canada and elsewhere. Yes, the number of the community is shrinking, but also the institutions, at least they are surviving the church, the political parties are doing their best to help. But the problem is that the demand for help is increasing. For example, if you will enter hospital, at least you have to put $1,000 as a deposit. And when mm. you want buy $1,000 in the black market, it's like, I don't know, 40 million Lebanese, which is like as if $20,000 on the official rate or something. 
uh, it's crazy. I know that people are dying in front of the hospitals. And now we have the pandemic, yes. We have now the cholera and other things. Uh, so I'm not very optimistic on the, on the future of Lebanon. The oil and gas is something promising, but also the Americans uh, will do their best in order to connect the future of oil and gas of Lebanon to also other uh, reformations in Lebanon. So it seems the future of Lebanon is also within the hands of the Americans to be decided. All right. Let's wrap our topics here. I'd like to ask each of you if there's been something on your mind this past week that you'd like to talk about. Uh, Hovik, do you have a rant? Why, yes, I do. Last week with Helen Mikhail and we talked about an ongoing census uh, in Armenia. And uh, since then, we were hoping that, you know, this would be a much needed update to Armenia statistics in terms of how many people live here, what their conditions are, you know, uh, whether they live in cities versus regions. And there is some troubling sort of news that officially the census collection was supposed to have ended today. You know, out of all of my friends, uh, you know, let's say I know, you know, 20 families or 10 families, none of them have been contacted by the census takers. And at least, they, I, you know, we're talking whether they, they were targeting 25% or 100% uh, sampling. And also there are news reports that people are concerned and are not talking to the census takers because they're concerned that it may be related to a military draft. So there might be a skew in terms of the data sets between if families have military age men. Um, so I'm not very optimistic about the census results. Obviously, given my um, opinion of this government, I'm not surprised, but I was hoping to be surprised. Yeria, yeah, what's on your mind? Uh, well, interestingly, I mean, in the couple of days, we start hearing that in Lebanon, especially in the north, and now in Beirut, cholera is spreading as if we are living in the ages of World War One, and uh, people are dying from around 80 people have died. Uh, I'm not sure what was the source, but of course, with pollution and the garbage and everything, the rivers are polluted. It seems that the world finished from COVID, but Lebanon is uh, having another pandemic. And this is very dangerous because our medical institutions and the hospitals are not fully functioning. So this is very troubling and concerning uh, news. Arthur, what's on your mind? What's on my mind is the uh, collapse of the education system in Armenia and the fact that in Armenia, pretty much anybody and everybody is a political science and international relations expert, and they're all on television. And you don't need to have any background, any education or experience to be a commentator, which kind of contributes to this general sense of confusion and despair in Armenia. So that's, that's what I'm very frustrated about. There's a lot of empty talk and there's a lot of misguided information and um, some people are fooled by it. And there's also this uh, division within the society. Uh, there are families, I mean, my own family, there are members of my family I can't even talk to because they still support this guy. They still support Mr. whatever his name is. So this, uh, that's, that's, what I, that's what I'm happy about. All right. Thank you very much. We're going to leave it there for today. Thanks for taking the time, Yeria and Arthur, talking with us. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. That's our show this week. We hope you found it informative. Now go find us on social media and follow us. Go, go, go. We'll talk to you next week.